Every once in a while we get a pianist who is on a whole nother level. The kind of guy that is envied by even all the other touring bros. The kind of player that when you hear him, your jaw hits the floor because you didn't even know this kind of playing was possible. Vladimir Horowitz was one of these guys. His Carmen variations is just, ugh, indescribably technical. But we're not talking about Vladimir Horowitz today, we're talking about an early stride player from the 1900s named Fred Morton, or as his friends called him, Jelly Roll. The technical playing facility of Jelly Roll Morton is just, uh, like, indescribable. It's so far advanced that even for the best players, it just seems completely out of reach, completely unattainable. But back in the day, Jelly Roll was seen as kind of a contemporary to James P. Johnson and Willie the Lion Smith, a great player, but not a standout player. But the song we're talking about today, The Finger Buster, it kind of set him apart. The Finger Buster, I think some people call it the Finger Breaker, this is not your average stride piece. This is his show-off piece. This is the 1900s equivalent of a Michael Jordan dunk. It's the kind, like you take your lady out for a night on the town, and after hearing this piece, your girl's going home with Jelly Roll. In his History of Jazz series, Dick Hyman used to perform this piece, and I think he used to say, he used to say Jelly Roll would challenge the incumbent pianist with it. So here, let me play it for you. <laughs> At second thought, maybe we better watch Dick Hyman play it. I quit. <laughs> There's certain performances in this world that make me want to flip my piano over and never go back. Uh, let's see. The Vladimir Horowitz, we've talked about like the uh, Carmen Variations or Star Stars and Stripes Forever. Uh, Art Tatum, Tiger Rag, it's got to be one. Oscar Peterson did this wild solo on Sweet Georgia Brown. Things like that. Like these things, they make me, they just make me feel completely inadequate as a player. There's a lot to unpack here. Let's start with the most obvious stuff, the tempo. It's 305 beats per minute. If you've ever tried to play ragtime or stride, you know that the left hand is the challenge. And it kind of gets exponentially harder as you go faster. If you're playing a stride ballad, like at 80 to 100 beats per minute, this is pretty reasonable to achieve. And as you get up into the faster stride pieces, like 180 to 200 beats per minute, it gets pretty challenging. But at 300 beats per minute, this is near impossible. 
So right out of the gate, there's an introduction that's playing descending diminished chords that are going down by half steps. And then when we get down to the bottom of the keyboard, he introduces our first motif, which is another kind of uh, syncopated arpeggio type thing that goes up the piano by half steps. I hesitate to call this a motif because it's not melodic. You couldn't sing it, but it recurs several times throughout and there's a variation on it. For example, when we get to the end of the A section, he plays the same motif, but he syncopates the right hand differently. And then again, at the end of the A section, he plays something very similar again, and yet syncopates it even a different way. So the notes aren't changing, but each time he plays it, he plays the rhythm slightly differently. He goes further and further away from the beat and then eventually comes back. So that's kind of the A section. We're exploring different rhythmic ideas for this uh, motif he's created that goes up by half steps. When we get into the next section, he starts introducing us to a new melody, but the thing to watch here is the left hand. He's doing a really common stride thing where he alternates a bass note with a chord. Bass notes on one and three, chords on two and four. In a ragtime style, you might alternate one and five as your bass notes. In this style, he's gonna actually start creating additional counter melodies or at least he's going to walk up and walk down between the chords at this point he's not doing anything really different in stride than his contemporaries would have but it's we can't ignore the tempo here at 305 beats per minute this thing is really fast see the curse of fast stride is that your arm wants to get tense right the faster it needs to move back and forth the more your muscles tense up and, and the funny thing is when your muscles get tense they move slower right they take more energy to move so the trick to playing stride quickly is to keep your hands loose and go back and forth but the problem with playing with a loose hand is that you sacrifice accuracy and the remarkable thing about these players like dick hyman and uh, jelly roll is that they got both they got the speed by being loose but they didn't sacrifice the precision as we keep going he reintroduces that motif again from the A section. We're going up by half steps, but yet again in different syncopated patterns. So as we come back to the A section for a second time, things ramp up a little bit. The melody becomes a little bit more playful in his right hand, and the left hand just becomes more technical for stride. He's making bigger leaps, he's playing in octaves, and he's doing some more chromatic walking bass stuff that we hadn't seen before. At this point, I kind of feel like he's taking a breather to prepare for the rest of the piece because he gives up the stride in the left hand. He just he goes to just walking a bass line in octaves. I say just walking a bass line in octaves. Again, everything at 300 beats per minute is hard. The right hand is much simpler than we had before. He's much more relaxed. He's kind of recomposing himself during this because there is some madness about to come. And then we are preparing to transition out of the key of B flat and into E flat. And he does that with these four measures. And this is where things start to get crazy. So we're going back to the melody for a third time and the right hand handles this with some octaves and block chords and nothing super fancy. But man, the focus here is on the left hand. Any pianist in the room is gonna get up and wanna see what the heck he is doing because the, the left hand stride that he's doing at this tempo in this section is, is just inhuman. The alternating bass jumps are getting bigger. The chords that he's landing on are getting richer. He's playing with different articulations. Some notes are long, some notes are short. He's playing with dynamics. And notably, he starts introducing counter melodies in those bass notes. At this point, it very much feels like we're reaching the climax of the piece. We're pushing the boundaries of what people are accustomed to ever hearing with stride music. Let's say, God forbid, you were in a horrible car accident and you lost your right arm and you had to play the rest of your career with only a left hand. If you were able to pull this off to play the stride left hand like he's doing here, it would be a miracle. I mean, the left hand on its own is just incredible. But as we go into the next section for the final time through the melody, uh, the right hand is just as crazy. <laughs> If you ever try to play serious stride music, one of the hardest things you have to do are times when both hands have to jump at the same time. When your hands are moving apart from each other like this at fast tempos, you can't look and see where your hands are aiming. At best, you can look at your left hand or your right hand, but you can't see both. They're too far apart from each other. And so you're going entirely off of muscle memory and feel at this point. My mind has a hard time computing exactly how this is possible to do. I've played a lot of stride in my career. I'm a, I'm a modestly decent stride player. This, this seems impossible. We've talked a little bit about hand independence with our hands moving in different directions. But he, at this point, he lets his right hand drop into half time. So his left hand continues going at full speed. His right hand is dropped into half tempo. And without changing the tempo in his left hand, he gradually increases the tempo in his right hand to get them back to where they match. So his right and left hand are not only doing these crazy technical things on their own, but he's now taken his right hand and put it in a completely different He brings the volume down, he slows his right hand down, left hand keeps going, then he brings them back together, brings the volume up, brings the tempos together, and then ends this thing with a bang. And just like that, in two and a half minutes, he's played 12 pages. I've had people come up to me after I've been performing and say, you've really been given a gift of music. 
And I cringe a little bit when I hear that because what they don't know is just how many hours that I have spent practicing. And presumably Jelly Roll was a human being. And the reason that he was able to do these things is because he was just willing to put in the time and effort to, to get there. The amount of dedication that it takes somebody for years and years and years to get to this level is absolutely incredible. But Jelly Roll was playing 10 to 12 hours a day for years and years and years. So that's inspiring to me. There are certainly people in this world like Dick Hyman and there are several other people on YouTube who have performed this piece and done so very well. Clearly it's not something I'm able to do, but it is inspiring to me to know that if I were willing to put in the dedicated effort, the time that it would take, that I too would be able to achieve this. You're going to see me challenge myself to play a song that was just barely on the edge of what I was capable of. You should check out this video where I learned how to play Charlie Parker's Donna Lee at full tempo.